Uh, thanks to our witnesses. I have to say the work that you do is among the most exciting that um, those of us who are lay people can think about. It, really, it truly is. And so thanks so much for everything that you do. Um, I, Dr. Grunsfeld, I want to follow up with your last response, and it really does have to do with this constrained uh, fiscal environment, because a number of the things that each of you has laid out requires an allocation of resources over a period of time. Um, uh, for us to get this, uh, get on with it, if you, if you will. And so I wonder if you can tell me how the current budget environment is really affecting exoplanet research and the additional technologies that are going to be needed um, over this next decade, and what are the likely impacts if we should continue with sequester into fiscal year 2014? So there is no question that the uh, the budget environment has caused us to have to make some tough choices. And, and whenever we try and make those tough choices, we think about balance, we think about scientific priorities. And in the case of exoplanets, uh, you know, we are very fortunate that we have uh, high-value observatories on orbit. And so one of the things we have to prioritize is, you know, what are we going to keep operating on orbit uh, that are returning, pr providing high scientific return? Uh, the latitude we have for adjusting to a changing budget is really in the start of new projects. Mm -hmm. And so as an example, even though we have selected uh, the transiting exoplanet survey satellite tests, uh, we have had to start to slow the start of that mission by about six months in, you know, just what we have seen from this year and looking into FY14. If we continue into a sequestered environment, you know, then we are going to have to look at perhaps turning off an uh, operating observatory or cutting back further on the development of new missions. And something like the uh, study for the NRO Asset Telescope, AFTA, you know, we would have to reduce our investment in that future, which would, of course, slow that down uh, further. Now, we haven't, that's a study. We haven't approved or come to you to ask for approval either. That's not approved internally within NASA or externally. Uh, we're just looking at the feasibility right now uh, on that. But that, it would slow down future development. Dr. Elvestad? Yeah, I'd, I'd say uh, there's there's two primary issues that we would have to think about in terms of the constrained fiscal environment. One is that some of the new observatories that I spoke about are more expensive to operate than the older observatories that we used to have. And so in a constrained environment, in order to operate those new tools, what sometimes has to give in the short term is the research grants to individual investigators. And as an example, I'll cite the ALMA telescope, which we're just bringing online, which we expect to be used very strongly in conjunction with JWST. So I'll just mention that's actually one of the ways that we will maximize the science is by trying to have these space and ground assets work together on coordinated programs. But one of the issues that we will run into is that ALMA, which is an international telescope, if we're not able to fund our investigators to do the research and to bring their postdocs and graduate students in, some of the best exoplanet science with that telescope might be done by our international partners and not by the U.S. investigators. So I think that's a very serious concern for us. Uh, the, the concern other than that is just being able to make sure that having invested lots of money in these big tools that we're able to operate them adequately, that we don't start doing things like scrimping on the infrastructure because we're trying to save a little bit of money here and there, and then essentially causing damage to the big investments we've already made. Well, let me follow that up because um, it's one of the concerns I've had, for example, with James Webb Space Telescope, is that we actually got you know a lot of extended lifespan out of the Hubble because a lot of upgrades were made over a period of time, and so that gave us a tremendous bang for the for the buck. But the question is whether you know if there if we face future delays that, you know, into 2018, will we beyond then be able to get more bang for the buck out of JWST in the same way that we did out of Hubble? Quite a long time ago, we looked at making the James Webb Space Telescope serviceable, similar to the Hubble, and largely due to the fact that it is an infrared telescope and it has to be very, very cold, uh, its design was to put it a million miles away from Earth. 
uh, and that is a very inaccessible place. And so we abandoned the idea of, of visiting it and upgrading it. So the James Webb Space Telescope doesn't have the capability for upgrades the way Hubble does. So what determines the James Webb Space Telescope lifetime is really the onboard fuel. And so we have designed it to a design requirement of five years. Um, but that is with, you know, being NASA, we have redundancy, we have reserves, you know, we plan for failures and uh, operations. We hope, uh, and actually the engineering says, we should get 11 years of life out of the James Webb Space Telescope in an actual operational mode uh, that we think we will use. Given that framing, we are looking very closely, and, and I am very excited about the partnership with observatories like the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, because that is the way we are going to maximize the output of the James Webb Space Telescope, is by using our other assets. Um, I have a little bit of a dream, but that dream is that not only will we have the ALMA and the James Webb Space Telescope, that will also have some overlap with the Hubble Space Telescope. And engineering mechanics will determine that lifetime, but right now Hubble is still doing well. Thank you.